Um, classroom rules. When you're evaluating your classroom rules, are they simple? Are they specific? Are they easily understood? Um, as Denise said, are they positively worded? Are class rules posted and at eye level, whatever the eye level happens to be for the children in that particular classroom? For children at lower developmental levels, do the rules have pictures or some other visual cue? Can more than 80% of the students repeat to you what is expected of them? Can they practice the rule? And can they give you behavioral examples of the rule? Those are all very important. And especially when you're dealing with really young kids. So with preschoolers, this is a classic parent complaint that, that, that their child knows the rule and doesn't do it. And these aren't even ADHD kids. These are just preschoolers. Um, but um, they're not supposed to run into the street after a ball. It's dangerous. They could get hit by a car. And the little kid will tell you. I'm not supposed to run into the street. After a ball, it's dangerous. I could get hit by a car. And five seconds later, what are they doing? They're running into the street after the ball. So not only can they repeat the rule, but can they practice it? And they, can they give you specific examples of it? Um, rules are only effective if students are aware of them, if they're capable of following them, and if they're taught how to follow them. Um, a lot of times we present rules to kids. We let them know what the rules are. But we need to teach rules as we do other skills. We need to read the rules. We need to model examples of the rules. We need to show them what that looks like. We need to do guided practice where, they, where we guide them through doing the rules and we give them feedback right then. And then we need to monitor how kids use the rules and give frequent feedback on how they're doing and very concrete feedback. like. Great job sitting quietly with your hands in your lap while you waited. Those kinds of things, specific feedback. So this is an example. And it's confusing because the slide also has children on it. <clears throat> but um, example of classroom rules for a younger class, follow teacher directions, um, a visual reminder of the teacher at the front of the room, talk friendly, keep your hands and feet to yourself, walk quietly in the hallway. And there's the walk. So. Um, another way, this is an ABA educational resource that's just a simple, when this happens, it leads to this. And this can be used for um, a rewarding sort of reinforcing activity, but it can also be used as a consequence, you know, a warning of a consequence. If this happens, this will, you know, picture of the principal or whatever. If you're working with a child with developmental delays in a classroom of more mature students, which many of us do, you will need to target the rules to the lower level, not the common level, obviously. Um, so that means that they, that they need to be understandable and they need to be um, achievable by all the students in the classroom. When we manage transitions well, it, it alleviates a lot of problems. So again, uh, teach the routine like the rules. Review the rules, review the routine, um, do they know the expectations and responsibilities of transitions? Do they know what comes before and what comes after? Do they know what will happen if they get it right and if they get it wrong? Um, limit the time. Don't make transitions too long because kids get lost. We think sometimes with kids who struggle with attention and focus that we need to give them more time, but it's actually just the opposite. <laughs> it's just the opposite. If they have too much time, they'll get lost in it. Engage students immediately in the next activity get their buy-in and get them going, behavioral mo uh, momentum. And then using helpers to indicate transitions for students who need it is also really helpful. There's a, I always uh, hold up the, the, the Rushville Preschool um, as an example, because I'd kind of like to go there myself. I'd kind of like to be a student in that classroom. Um, and they just do a really good job every year at this stuff. Their transitions are like clockwork. Um, the kids know what's coming. They know what to do next. There are visual reminders everywhere. There are pumpkins taped to the floor and each one of them stands on a pumpkin during October when they're getting ready to line up and then it changes to snowflakes or whatever. There's always a visual reminder of where they're supposed to be and where they go next. And it helps tremendously. Um, so 
settling kids down quickly during transitions. The other thing that happens in a, in a, in a classroom of any kind where transitions are pr and problematic, and transitions are problematic for everybody, but they're particularly traumatic and, well, traumatic might be too strong of a word, but they're problematic for kids who have emotion regulation problems, right? Um, because they have to settle again. They have to get activated and go from this to this, and then they have to settle. And they have to do that within a certain timeline. So settling kids down quickly during transitions is really important. So with, with younger kids, you know, things like lining up examples, where the teacher will say, one, two, three eyes on me, and then the kids will repeat it back. So it gives them something specific to do, something concrete to do to settle them once they've uh, reached where they're going. Um, I've, I've been in classrooms where they do a combination of snaps and claps and then the student has to echo those after the teacher. So that requires them to pay attention enough to be able to do it. And it's very easy for them to monitor whether they're getting that right because all their peers around them are doing it. Teachers will do things to encourage quieter voices like the whisper, if you can hear my voice, touch your nose. <laughs> and only the students who are focused on the teacher will be able to, to follow through with that. And then, of course, using nonverbals or posters, picture schedules. Uh, the cleanup song is a big one in the in the head starts, you know, to 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 uh, trigger cleaning up behavior. Ringing bells, using timers, counting down to transitions. So again, these are strategies you see a lot in preschools and in head starts. But they're also strategies that we might need to pull into play for kids who are older, but who are for whatever reason functioning at a lower developmental level. Even if cognitively they're not lower, if socio emotionally they're lower, they're going to need some more of this scaffolding and structure. Um, than their same age peers might. Um, problems with transition. Most, most of our kids, most of the kids that we're talking about today tend to exhibit more of their problem behaviors during less structured times, right? So that can be transitional times, that can be hallway times, that can be recess, um, that, that can be PE. Very young children and children with certain disorders are, have particular problems. What's the particular problem that kids on the autism spectrum have? Stopping an activity. Yeah, yeah. Um, stopping one activity at all, and especially doing it on somebody else's timeline, um, is very problematic. And so it can trigger all sorts of emotional responses, right? You'll, you'll see kids who are tantruming, who break down, who become very distressed, very emotional. Also true for what other group that we talked about earlier today? ADHD. Mm, somewhat. One more. Yes. OCD. Yep, kids with OCD, right? Um, because they may not have completed what they feel like they had to complete before they have to go on to the next task. So it can be very emotionally distressing. <coughs> um, simple schedules, and schedules maybe that are different and are tailored for a child who has a particular transitional problem. So this one obviously is very simple. This is what's gonna happen in the morning, what's gonna happen in the afternoon, what's gonna happen in the evening. But most of the kids with pretty significant behavioral problems that I work with who have to have schedules, they're much, much more detailed than this. So it's class by class or activity by activity. This follows this. Um, and especially for, her, for our kids who are on the autism spectrum, having that very specific understanding of what's going to come next and what I can expect is, is very important. We talked about this already. Um, but. Providing large uh, doses of positive attention before misbehavior avoids a lot of misbehavior. It's hard to do. This is one of those things that we know it works, and if I, and if I could say just do one thing different, um, it would be all of us, including myself, doing more of this, but it's hard to do because you're trying to deal with a whole bunch of different students with a whole bunch of different needs, and you've gotten to the end of a class period suddenly, and maybe you haven't done this as much as you wanted. Um, so uh, there are some kind of uh, ways to do this, and we'll talk about some specific strategies. So using positive attention preventatively, preventatively, positively interacting with students during lessons or center times. So you can vary the type of contact. So sometimes it's physical, so a, you know, a nudge or a verbal or a visual, just making eye contact with them. Sometimes it varies by the individual you're attending to or you're attending to their small group. You guys are all sitting so nicely. Look at you sitting there. And you're dosing that attention around, but you're not necessarily singling out one student. You're just spreading it there. Um, mixing instructional and social interactions over the course of the day. Turning bad behaviors good. Um, one of the things that we have to teach parents a lot 
um, different in terms of differential attention is not only attending more to the appropriate we call them everyday average okay behaviors right we're not waiting till you fold a load of laundry to praise you we're gonna praise you for just doing everyday average okay things because when you're doing those you're not doing the other really problematic things but so we not only have to teach that but we also have to teach them to ignore a lot of the minor negative behaviors that are annoying but not particularly problematic because the more you attend to those, even more you have to attend positively in order to have the right balance. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a two-pronged attack there. Reinforcing behaviors that will prevent the display of the undesirable behaviors. So I love the way the kids in the kitchen center are cleaning up. I like the way Sammy and Cassie are sitting on their circles. Focusing on the deed is best. Attaching praise to the behavior we want to see more of. Thank you for helping collect the papers. Thank you for sitting so quietly while you waited. That's awesome how gentle you're being with the toys. The student knows exactly <coughs> what he or she has done to earn that praise. And again, most of these kids are very concrete. If you just say, hey, good job, or hey, good girl, they're not going to necessarily know what it was they did that you want to see more of. This is another way of saying what we said earlier. Okay. Um, 